Hi, hello, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to welcome to the event influencers and the video game industry from social responsibility to legal liability organized by the interactive entertainment law review and the Center for commercial law studies uh, Queen Mary. Um, so this is the this is the next entry in our series of events highlighting and spotlighting uh, interesting articles from our journal. Um, all articles are interesting, but these are the ones that we are highlighting. So the article we're focusing on today is influencer marketing in the video game industry. And uh, the article is by Hannah Callens and it explores the phenomenon of influencers and their endorsement practices in the video game industry. Uh, to speak about this very topical and very challenging issue, I'm sure it has uh, become a personal interest to many of us who are trying to homeschool children, keep them entertained. Um, we have uh, three speakers. The first is the author of the article, Hannah Callens. Hannah has an LLM in intellectual property law during which she came into contact with interactive entertainment law and developed an interest in it. At the moment, she's completing a program in management education at ESCP Business School to understand the business side of the video game industry. And to this end, she has also established a student society at ESCP to bring interactive entertainment closer to the business students. Uh, with Hannah, we have Kostya Lobov and Isabel Davies. Kostya is a partner at Harpleton and Lewis and has a particular interest in the interactive entertainment sector and also advises on advertising laws, self-regulatory codes and related consumer protection issues. Isabel has an interest in the digital entertainment industry and her practice includes advising on video games, esports, and digital broadcast. So I think without further ado, I will turn this over to Hannah to tell us about her article, um, and then also uh, to, to introduce the article and to kickstart the discussion. Well, before that, before that, uh, a note about questions. So uh, please, uh, as questions occur to you, please feel free to put them in the chat, or if you would prefer, you can leave them to the end. We have reserved some time for questions and answers. So again, feel free to put this in the chat uh, or leave that for the end, whichever you like. So uh, Hannah, would you like to uh, kick off the discussion? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for being here. I'm very delighted to speak to you tonight. Um, just regarding the article, I will actually just summarize kind of the um, key points of the article. Uh, does the article, it deals with misleading advertisements in video of kidfluencers or kid influencers. Kidfluencers are young children with lots of followers on social media platforms who, for instance, upload videos on YouTube. In the videos of these uh, kidfluencers are, is sometimes advertisement embedded, which is not always properly disclosed. And to illustrate my point, I will kind of short, uh, show a short part of a case study that I've used. The case study is about Evan, and Evan is a kid fluencer with 6.75 million subscribers on YouTube. And in one of his video, he actually advertises a game, Puzzles and Dragons, for Nintendo 3DS. Um, if you can play like the first uh, 15 seconds of the... Uh, um, of Evan, yeah. This video is brought to you by Nintendo. Hey guys, it's Evan from Evan from HD, and today we're going to be checking out an awesome game for the Nintendo 3DS. It's a Puzzle and Dragons double feature. You get two massive games in one game pack: Puzzle and Dragons Z and Puzzle and Dragons Super Mario Brothers Edition. For the first time ever, Mario and his friends are joining the popular Puzzle and Dragon series. This Puzzle and Dragon. Okay, and as, um, as you all seen, like in the beginning, the sentence, this video is brought to you by Nintendo, is um, kind of the sentence that shows uh, that the video contains advertisements. But based on recent studies, um, it actually shows that children do not always understand um, this disclosure. For instance, they consider it more as a pre-roll advertisement, and it's actually an advertisement that plays before the content that we are watching on YouTube that we all know of like skip ad. 
And that's actually quite alarming. Um, then uh, to continue, um, based on the current European advertisement regulation, it's actually not clear if uh, the advertisement disclosure of Evan breaches the regulations or not. And therefore the article actually highlights three shortcomings. The first shortcoming um, is about the identification principle. And the ident identification principle states that advertisements should be easy to recognize. But the formulation of this principle is rather general and abstract. And therefore actually advertisements, advertisers can easily hide behind this principle. And for instance, the uh, sentence of Evan um, can raise discussion whether it's easy to recognize for children or not. Then the second shortcoming uh, is about the responsibility for YouTube uh, to, put, to protect children against advertisements. Um, YouTube must include several control measurements, um, but the problem here is that uh, these control measurements may vary from country to country as each member state can actually impose their own um, control measurements. And then a last shortcoming is regarding the enforcement. The concrete influencer marketing regulation is written down in self-regulatory codes. And these codes are written by the industry and the advertiser and the influencer can actually decide themselves if they apply it or not. But in case of a breach of these codes, um, there can be um, imposed several sanctions, but these sanctions are not very severe. For instance, a fine cannot be uh, imposed. And then very short, some recommendations. I actually recommended in the article to draft a European uh, self-regulatory code that contains two things. First of all, um, it must contain um, um, practical standards on how, when, and which advertisement disclosure uh, must be used on a European level. And moreover, also um, it must contain several common standards of YouTube, um, kind of which uh, control measurements should be used also on a European level. And to ensure the enforcement of uh, this, in, uh, like this European self-regulatory code, uh, it can be rec uh, recommended that the uh, self-regulatory bodies should collaborate with the governmental bodies in this sense that they kind of can impose more severe sanctions such as a fine. And that are actually the key points of the article. Thank you very much, Hannah. And just to pick up on, I think one of the, one of the key things uh, from your article is the kind of picture you paint of this or fragmentation across uh, different European member states. And as you said earlier, each member state has a lot of leeway to implement its own laws. And uh, obviously YouTube and other similar platforms are global in nature. And so therefore uh, it's not clear how would they comply or which set of, uh, which, which set of standards they comply with. And I think I would like to invite uh, Kostya and Isabel to give their take on this, uh, from a, uh, especially from a practitioner's perspective. Uh, perhaps we start with Kostya and then move on to Isabel. Yeah, thank you. Um, really good intro, by the way, and I think it sets the scene really well. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we can talk about, you know, European standards and laws. Uh, obviously, the UK will, at the moment, is, is under the same kind of... Uh, it's aligned largely, but in the future could diverge now that Brexit has been finalized. But ultimately, all of this is global. As you said, the, the platforms are global. Uh, games businesses are global. Influencers don't particularly pick and choose, you know, from the nationality of the brand that they're going to be paid by. So I think it's, to tackle it holistically, you do have to look at it on a global scale. And it's it's a conundrum for brands, I can tell you, because... You know, I, I don't know how Nintendo does it. And by the way, I hope, I hope there's nobody from Nintendo in this uh, <laughs> in this chat because we're going to be discussing this at length. But no, but seriously, there's, you know, a global organization like Nintendo or any other needs to decide how it's going to approach the disclosure dilemma on a global scale, because at least with the clients I've worked with, it's impractical to have different standards for different countries or different groupings of countries you're gonna have um, one set of standards, one set of rules that you're going to require 
your influencers if you're instructing them directly or your you know a talent agency if you're going through an agency uh, to get the influencers to abide by and that set of rules has to work in the US as much as it works in Australia in Europe the UK France etc so in practice what's often done is you choose the lowest common or highest common denominator depending on how you look at it but basically the strictest country out of the ones that are important markets slash territories that you're specifically targeting as it happens the uk quite often ends up being that country it depends slightly what you're talking about but for quite a lot of things uh, we seem to be up there among the strictest territories um, so that is quite often used as a yardstick obviously the us is often uh, also looked at so you know, clients will always have, uh, you know, games companies, publishers, studios will have one eye on what the FTC has said uh, on some of these issues as well. And that's, and that's honestly how it works. You feel your way through it and you come up with something which you think uh, mitigates enough of the risk for the business, even though it may not perfectly follow the letter of the, the law or the regulation in, in each and every country around the world. Yeah, just to follow on from what Kosti is saying, um, you know, a, a lot of the regulators in this area as well are quite often looking for companies that have at least, you know, made a conscious effort to abide by these rules. Yes, that sometimes doesn't get you all the way there, but in practice, they are looking at mostly the biggest offenders or the ones that are getting the most press attention. And as Costa rightly said, because of the the variety of, of, of laws and different guidance in place across even just Europe, um, quite often... Um, clients will look at a, a, a country like the UK who has been looking into this issue for a number of years now and there's you know a number of guidance out from various bodies but you know equally countries like Germany are catching up with us and there's a number of cases going through Germany at the moment which currently are completely odds with each other that will probably go up to the federal court in Germany and perhaps they will have a more solid position there but for most clients they will as you say take a look at mostly the strictest the strictest countries or countries where they know they'll have a lot of an audience viewership or perhaps the brand is headquartered there or perhaps the influencer is headquartered at a particular country and take a kind of holistic approach because at the end of the day you're not likely to meet all the rules as they currently are which is i i, I expect why hannah has, has has suggested that some sort of european code at least on a on a on a european level would be an interesting thing to explore for brands can I mention something that's been mentioned in the chat just now? So I think it's Michaela and uh, Tangi who's just uh, mentioned this point about uh, business models and how well people understand them. I, I did a little bit of re-reading of some research done by uh, Ipsos Mori commissioned by the ASA. I think Hannah, you mentioned this in your paper uh, as well. It was done, it's a couple of years old, it was 2019, so take it with a pinch of salt, but it was basically about how well uh, consumers of all ages and all social classes and, and groupings recognize various types of identification of ads. And by ads, I mean, uh, it wasn't specifically to do with YouTube. It was more about Facebook, Instagram and, and similar, but it's, it's the same kind of principle. And it's just shocking how even the most, what you and I would consider the most blatant, obvious, you know, in your face identification of an advert, i.e. a massive hashtag advert right at the beginning before you engage with the content. Even in those cases, it was barely 50% of uh, the group uh, of the participants who said that they would definitely recognize that as an advert. And a lot of them simply said stuff like, uh, this is all ages, by the way. So the research covered uh, kids from 13 upwards all the way up to you know 64 years old and plus. Um, a lot of people, even with those tags present, said things like, oh, well, you know, she's just posting the yogurt that she likes. Surely that's, that's not an ad. You know, <laughs> she's just, she just likes to eat that yogurt. Um, so it's, it's incredible how little, at least back in 2019, how little understanding there was of this issue. I suspect it's getting better gradually, but it's certainly not a problem that's limited to just children. To kind of pick up uh, like on what Kostya said, uh, it's also mentioned in the article, but there has been uh, quite a lot of studies about this. And for instance, um, like uh, there were um, some advertisements shown to uh, children between uh, 12 and 16 years old. 
and they could not say with a lots of advertisements uh, what it would be would be uh, sponsored or not. And to kind of prove also how effective uh, this Kidfluencer marketing is, um, another fact is that 80%, almost 80% of like children asked um, their parents to buy something that actually um, an influencer um, advertised. So there is a very big business there. And especially uh, since the, uh, like the regulation is so um, kind of diverse and it's really not clear what they should write and what also like children actually understand. I think there, yeah, there is a very big um, field that we still need to explore uh, from a legal per perspective. Yes, and also just to, uh, obviously children are particularly vulnerable to this kind of uh, influencer uh, advertise, advertising, but uh, based on what Kostya said and also some discussions we've had previously, I wonder if this doesn't also apply to influencer advertising generally rather than you know that which is specifically targeted at children. So is there anything on influencer advertising more generally? Uh, do we have rules around that? Perhaps? I think we have rules right now um, in almost every European country, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the problem at this point is uh, that, for instance, from my home country, which is Belgium, that we actually have too many rules. Uh, we have three um, enforcement bodies, which all have like their own or legislation or self-regulatory code, where there are like lots of inconsistencies regarding the scope of application, regarding definitions, also regarding uh, which kind of advertisement disclosure they should use. And there is also a kind of a call from the influencers themselves that they are very, very uh, confused about what they can use and what they can't use. Uh, for instance, like, again, what I told you, like brought to you by Nintendo, children do not really recognize it as, um, an advertisement disclosure and uh, even like hashtag ad in some countries you can use it. In other countries, it's not, it's not sufficient as you cannot use the abbreviation. You should use like hashtag advertisements. So I think when I would be an influencer and I would not have like any legal background, I think it's very not as easy to um, kind of see, uh, know which type of advertisements or like disclosure that I should use. I mean, what, one thing that comes out from the research is that what really does help is making whatever you want to call it. And by the way, we're talking about, we're grouping several things here. We're grouping ads where there's, you know, money or products that have been provided and control over the content itself. You know, situations where maybe a product's provided, but there's no control over the content. You just provide it in the anticipation that they all say positive things and all sorts of other situations uh, in between. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a tricky one. It, it's a risk for brands, isn't it? Because ultimately, if any complaint is going to be made or any enforcement action is going to be taken, it's not going to be against YouTube. It will be against the brand and possibly the influencer jointly. And ultimately, you know, there is clearly a risk to the influencer because, you know, they lose trust from their community and they could have uh, repercussions there, but it's a big risk for the brand. And I think that risk is amplified when you're dealing with children, not just because, you know, they're children, it's more difficult to kind of guarantee what, how it is they're going to say things and present them, but also because the rules are stricter. So the moment you're using, if, if the content is an ad and it features a child and therefore by implication is probably targeted at children, you've immediately activated a whole set of rules in the UK and most other countries, which is specifically there to deal with uh, advertising to or featuring children and suddenly it's stricter you know there's limits on what activities you can show how you can encourage somebody to buy something you know can you guarantee that evan is not going to make a direct exhortation to his fellow children to to buy that particular game it's pretty difficult and if, if he does ultimately it's nintendo or whoever it is who who, who paid him that's uh, on the hook so I, th I think we'll probably get to what the solution is here to towards the end, but I think it's going to be a joint effort ultimately between 
several groups. I suspect no no one party is in an ideal position to solve this, and it might be a case of you know both making it uh, providing an incentive to influencers themselves to do this, uh, but also getting more buy-in from platforms. Because actually, the one thing that really made a difference when they saw more read the research is where you had. Uh, non-native tags for the content. So i.e. a tag provided as, as a function by Instagram or YouTube or Facebook, which actually changed, you know, the framing of the post, changed the shading, changed the appearance in, in, in very subtle ways, but it immediately made it stand out from the surrounding organic content. That's what made the biggest difference. And that's what people could point to and say, oh yes, okay, I, I know that's an ad because it, it looks slightly different to everything else. If you're just putting a tag in among the text that the person has written, even if that tag is upfront or, or big or whatever, it's it's a lot less effective. Anecdotally as well, you, you see content as well, particularly on YouTube nowadays, where you get people using the paid promotions tool, but then um, they will put it against a white background or something on that particular part of the video. So it's basically illegible. So you've ticked the box from a, from a you know, contract perspective or whatever, but actually, you know, one of the points that Hannah makes in her, um, in her article is that because the, the wording under the, the legislation is so broad, there are ways that people are trying to game the system. I mean, if that actually ended up in front of a court, I doubt they would have much sympathy for, you know, games like that. But equally, it is interesting how, you know, these tools are being used and in some ways very effectively, but equally, a lot of the regulators don't see that using those tools is sufficient and some people are still trying to, you know, game those tools, essentially. I think... Actually, perhaps we can, from there, move on to talk about uh, enforcement and specifically, you know, who should be doing, who should be doing the enforcement, I mean, who should be doing the actual work of regulation. And I know, Hannah, you've proposed essentially legislative measures and also uh, some forms of co-regulation. Uh, but then I wonder if uh, we've, uh, whether there were other ways, uh, because Hannah, you've also outlined po possible gaps in, mm -hmm. in all of this. And of course, Isabel has highlighted the way people can circumvent rules. And although you could get them in front of a regulator, that's just not going to happen at scale, or it's going to be really difficult and costly to do it at scale. So uh, does the panel have any thoughts on what would be more effective in terms of regulation? Um, we can go very blue sky here. So actually, kind of enlighten what I proposed. I think actually what uh, Kostya has mentioned before, uh, that it must be a common uh, effort of like multiple stakeholders, not solely like the legislator, but also of course the influencer and the brand themselves, because otherwise we're not gonna get there. Um, but regarding um, the enforcement right now, the problem is again, what I have highlighted that there were like way too, def uh, way too many um, yeah, kind of enforcement bodies. And I think we should definitely stay on a national level um, because like you cannot do it like on a European level because yeah, first of all, the territory is too big and um, it would not be very uh, effective. But then again, like national, like uh, content on internet goes beyond boundaries does children from France can access um, content from, yeah, from anywhere in the, like in Europe or like in the world to, yeah, again, it's not as easy to um, like cope with the regulation of France and then again, cope with different legislation across Europe. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? I mean, the regulation, is a is a bit of a blunt tool you know what i mean is the good old-fashioned law it's a bit blunt and it's frankly a little bit slow by the time you get something through it's either slow or it's vague or both because if you make it too specific then it's going to be too slow to be relevant by the time it gets through so you have to make it a bit vague and then really have you improved the position significantly because you've just introduced something else which has to be ultimately interpreted by a regulator or an arbiter somewhere and I almost think to an extent we have enough of that you know there's there are tools each country has tools whatever you want to call them 
to, to really hit brands over the head if they get this wrong, if they want to use them. Um, and they have varying degrees of severity and punishment and fines that they can uh, impose in these situations. So, you know, I wonder if we need to do more on the kind of, and I think we are, by the way, you know, talks like this help and, you know, there's, there's a lot of effort by the ASA and other bodies to really educate people about this, but it's the education piece, I wonder, which needs to be uh, improved, really, to, to get it out there. You know, as I say, I was reading this research, I was just shocked that just a huge proportion of the population, forget kids, everybody, they just don't understand how this works. They just don't get it that what they are, are seeing as you know a genuine opinion of a person they like is actually just something they got paid to say they don't really get it they don't understand the difference between affiliate links sponsored content uh, you know uh, or, or just a pure advert so i think the more people understand that the more it will just become indispensable for influencers to to be very very clear and upfront no matter what words they say i mean frankly they could just just explain very clearly up front, you know, in the voice, that would probably be the best way of doing it. It's just to say, here's the deal. Nintendo sent me this game and told me to say things about it. Actually, I quite like the game anyway, uh, as it happens. So what I'm telling you is the truth, but just so you know, they did pay me to, to make this video, Boom, you know? Um, but until they kind of, until that becomes essential uh, uh, to do in order for influencers to keep their communities happy, it's, it's gonna continue to be patchy, I think, but it, it is getting better. I mean, just you look at the number of cases that have gone through the ASA involving influencers over the last few years, you know, there's been a lot of focus on this and I think uh, things are improving. Yeah, I definitely think there is a, the ultimate question as well of whether the regulators need, should be pushing the platforms more. You know, as, as Costa highlighted, you know, evidence shows that if there are tools inbuilt in those platforms, that's the most effective way of making sure that people understand um, you know that that content is commercial and ultimately a lot of the directives and regulations that Hannah discusses in her her article are ultimately you know down to the service provider to 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 abide by and I think it is it is great that there are bodies out there like the ASA and other uh, advertising bodies in other European countries that are picking up individual cases on individual influencers but there is the question of whether you know up to a, up to a point does that does that help us get to a critical mass of you know education and understanding or is is you know is more radical solutions needed should should youtube for example be providing not just a single you know paid promotions label but a kind of a suite of tools that allows somebody to pick and choose either what works for them or what works in their territory i expect that's probably not in youtube's interests um you know which is probably a lot of what this comes down to right um unless the hand is being truly forced by a regulator or a court case etc then then why would they go out of the way to do anything more than you know a kind of as you say a, a paltry effort perhaps um so as, as as Hannah rightly highlights, there is a big portion of this um, is down to basically, you know, how far should the platforms be involved and should should regulators be actually asking these questions to, you know, the likes of YouTube more directly rather than just going after individual um, influencers and brands, essentially. To kind of quickly pick up on the uh, chat, what Edwin wrote, uh, he asked if there is like sufficient social value in influencer advertisements. Um, let's say that an advertisement is actually um, the most uh, efficient when people like the audience don't know that they are watching an advertisement. And I can say like maybe with big influencers, there is a very, um, they're more aware of like the social um, values, but Right now, these, these days, uh, there is like uh, also very uh, popular of micro influencers. Uh, these are kind of influencers who are very engaged with their uh, community. And I think that if you're like an influencer and you get contacted by a brand, you kind of feel a recognition that, oh, uh, my, my social media page is getting popular. Brands want to collaborate with me. And if the brands also maybe not very known brands actually say like, okay, maybe, um, you, okay, there is all this regulation, but maybe just kind of conveniently hide it in your contents uh, that your influ like your con uh, like your audience don't know that it is an ad. I think this social value, it would 
quickly like evades because you're very happy and you're not going to kind of contradict the brands that who wants to collaborate with you. Yes, and I think, you know, just picking out some, some of the other things uh, in the chat, other than Adrian, hi Adrian, uh, uh, Adrian's question. We've got uh, questions, I think, from Michaela and a few other people about the difficulties of actually getting children to tell the difference between advertising and non-advertising. And perhaps one of the ways of cutting the Gordian knot and avoiding all of these difficulties is just to say, you cannot advertise to children below the uh, age you know, at which they develop the ability to tell the difference, whatever that is. I think Hannah, you do have a number for us on that. So what do we think about, um, well, what do you think about that? This is for the whole panel, obviously. Should we just say, don't advertise to children below the threshold of uh, reason, for instance? Um, yeah, go ahead. What do you mean by advertise to children? Though? Then you get into the sort of the semantics of where do you draw the line when something, can, can you advertise a lawful product, which is a toy designed to be played with by a child? How do you advertise that toy? Because we, we have to be careful not to kind of, you know, overstep the mark and just prevent things that, you know, advertising is lawful. It is permissible to advertise. And actually, I think there's a lot of social value in advertising. So I don't want to go slating the, the ad industry too much. Then again, you know, what we're talking about here is one of the oldest problems in advertising, which has existed long before social media, the Internet and influencers, you know, the good old humble advertorial and the newspaper and and you know since the early days as hannah says you know one of the most efficient ways to advertise to somebody is for them not to realize that they're being advertised to so it's a very old problem we're just applying it to a new situation but yeah i think we've got to be careful not to kind of demonize the industry um uh, as a whole so i think for example somebody suggested you know an outright ban on on influencers i think that would be very difficult to implement in practice because you're really interfering with people's right to, to contract and enter into a commercial uh, arrangements at that point. Yeah, I think at least at least from, you know, looking at the, you know, legislation of the guidance and what the regulators care about as well. It seems like at the moment regulators are very much preoccupied with what content is advertised to children rather than advertising to children full stop. So obviously unhealthy eating, tobacco, alcohol, all the kind of fairly obvious ones and stuff that have been clamped down increasingly over the years. Maybe it's a it's kind of a step sideways to think just more, you know, wider should advertising to children be happening at all and what should that look like? And I think certainly like within the within the realms of Hannah's article, it's very much, you know, advertising to children is happening, but what what should that look like and how should we be approaching that? And I think that seems a more realistic um goal in a sense rather than just saying right just no children to no advertising to children outright essentially to kind of um give some additional information um actually this question have been uh, like uh, analyzed in the european union with the change of like the audiovisual media service directive in 2018 and for instance, they have banned uh, product placements in children uh, programs and sponsorship um, may be kind of, um, yeah, decided by each country themselves. Um, but again, like, um, I think it's way more difficult to prevent like product placements in um, influencers online, um, yeah, like influencer content online than just on television. Because on television, you always have like a production house that actually controls the content that is, uh, um, yeah, written, written and so on. Just, I don't know, it's at the moment, it's product placement is already uh, banned, but I don't know. Yeah, you have like the legislation and then you have the practice, just, it doesn't really align. Yes, Quite so that would be the problem, I think, with uh, banning influencer advertising because then you, you just move the question to a different place. Like what is influencer advertising? I mean, you can't stop people from going online and making videos right. to say, I like this thing. You might like it too, because uh, we have the same we have the same interests. Kostya, did you want to come in? Uh, I was just gonna say this, the question or the point about parental consent is an interesting one, because I mean, presumably 
to the extent that a contract exists of some sort, it will be a contract with the parent as the guardian because the, a minor, at least in, in the UK and a lot of other countries, can't lawfully enter into an agreement. So technically, I suppose there is, you know, presumably the consent is there and either the parents are encouraging it or at the very least are aware that their, their kid is uh, contracting with, with the brand uh, to do this. But that, that is an interesting question, whether, you know, that should be allowed and, you know, that raises all sorts of, you know, issues in a different area about undue influence and, you know, parents really pushing their kids to do this. I'm not saying that's the case with Evan because I think, I think he's, he's got a very special family where they're all YouTubers, I think, or like all his brothers, brothers and his parents are, all do it. So it's, it's a slightly unusual scenario. Yeah, I think definitely the kind of the side piece to this is, you know, we're thinking about the children watching the videos, but actually the children do the ones doing the influencing are well. That's a whole separate kind of, you know, child protection question. And, you know, France have very recently brought out a law that covers this. They've, you know, put kid influencers basically in the same category as child models, uh, child sports stars. And recently they did it for esports um stars as well under the age i think either 16 or 18 i can't remember off the top of my head but you know they're very conscious about you know i think the child essentially has the right to have all their videos deleted if they don't want to essentially a kind of right to forgotten they their money is put in some sort of trust that their parents can't essentially spend all of it um so france is is pretty ahead of the curve on this and it will probably be a few years before perhaps other countries catch up to this because at the end of the day you're looking at Essentially, you know, millions and millions of children watching these videos and being affected by deceptive advertising, and then a much smaller pool of children that are actually the ones creating it. But equally, there are ethical and legal questions that probably need to be answered there as well, as um, Costi rightly points out. Yes. So I think the child, the child protection angle, obviously, is beyond the scope of Hannah's article. But I do think it is an important issue, and it's interesting that. Uh, uh, France is uh, regulating that in the same way that they would regulate uh, child actors and child actors and so on. And yeah, I just think it would be interesting to see when other countries decide to do the same thing. Um, right. I think perhaps uh, we can go, I think perhaps we can start going through some of the questions. Um, just flicking through as well to see what, what I've missed. <laughs> There's a question about affiliate links and from Salvo and do we think, uh, how do we think we should understand this in terms of advertising? Well, you know, I think, as, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people don't, don't understand what an affiliate link is. And actually of all the, of all the tags that were analyzed in, in the research I mentioned, I think affiliate scored the lowest in terms of people scratching their heads and wondering what does it mean it was down there with hashtag sp or hashtag spawn which when you're advertising a yogurt people might think it's meant to be spoon hashtag spoon i wondered so you know it's it's not very helpful and frankly i don't see that used very much nowadays because it's just yeah very odd um but yeah there's you know affiliate link so this is where you you, you have a contract and you know get provided with a special uh, link or a discount code uh, which your followers can then use to get a discount when they buy a, a particular product and you earn a small commission so it's a it's a species um, it's a species of advertising yeah it's you know there's one of the sub denominations and uh, you know in, in the UK the ASA has, a, has had a really fun time trying to kind of carve up the dividing lines between all these different forms of advertising and you know in the early stages there was discussion as to whether you know if the brand did not have control over the content if they just sent you a game and said hey here you go enjoy full stop yours sincerely nintendo um then you know is that really an ad or is that more like sponsored content you know what if what if you don't get keep get to keep the game what if the game is given to you digitally on a timed access maybe it's like a pre-release game and you get to play it uh, and and then the access ends and that's it. You haven't kept anything. You haven't been paid anything. The brand hasn't told you what to say. Is that a form of advertising? Especially if, let's say, the early access means that you get your YouTube video out there before everybody else, and therefore you get all the hits, and therefore technically you get more advertising revenue, but that revenue comes from YouTube, not from the brand. So is that still monetary considerations there's uh, there, there aren't answers to all of these by the way like i don't think there's definite answers to, to any of them but 
but uh, yeah, there's a lot of these in between things that are um, very tricky. Um, and that's just in the games industry. You know, other industries have, have had long traditions of doing things a certain way and not necessarily identifying. So for example, in the car industry, it's very common to get car reviewers from several countries, fly them all out to Sweden where a new car is being winter tested. They all get to drive it, spend a night in the hotel and fly back. I mean, that's pretty clear to me that that is something. It might not be advertising if they're not being told what to say, although, you know, query whether there's quite a lot of pressure on them to write a positive review but it's at the very least uh you know either sponsored content or it's this monetary consideration there because clearly the flights and the, the hotel and everything else and how often do you see that disclosed i don't know how many of you are into cars or read car reviews but it's you know it's very very rarely mentioned i'm seeing a little bit more now but it's it's you know that's another industry that's going to have to adjust to how all this works and you know and these reporters they probably wouldn't consider themselves influencers they just think oh well i'm just a journalist you know i'm just doing my job you know what's what's wrong but actually it's the same regime that uh, applies and i think oh sorry can you want to come in just to kind of uh, pick up on uh, Cassia's argument regarding like the different forms of, of advertisement kind of the product placement or um the advertorial that the influencers use um it's, it's commonly known, it's been known in the television industry for many years, but the problem is online, it's just not, not as clear because like, you know, if you, as, as you have like the symbol of PP that there is like product placements. And of course, you know that uh, movies are sponsored by brands. But if I'm actually just watching YouTube, I'm more like passively watching, going through it, through the contents. Um, and I'm not really actively thinking, oh, maybe this um, this uh, video would contain advertisements or, oh, this is a nice product, um, would the influencer be paid by it? Instead, if you look at just like linear, um, like just normal television shows, and then you have like this advertisement break, then you actually know that, okay, this is all advertisement, uh, you kind of filter it, so especially for, for, for children, um, I think it's way more difficult um, to kind of, um, yeah, know what is advertisement and not online, especially because they don't have like the, the break or something. And yeah, I think moreover also because they have like a very close connection to their, um, to these influencers that it, actually even makes it more harder to recognize it. Yeah, maybe we're all dinosaurs and we're looking at it the wrong way. We're thinking about hashtags and what word can we put where. But actually, again, I keep coming back to this research, but it was interesting that some of the factors which were very helpful to people in recognizing if something is an ad actually have nothing to do with how it was tagged or labeled. But for example, is the person sitting in an unnatural pose? You know, if I sit there like this, you know, take a photo of that sort. It's sorry, the brand's the wrong way around. Uh, you know, it's quite obvious to you that that's not how a person would normally sit, and it's clearly a staged photograph. It's not a natural pose. And actually, it was interesting how little factors like that. Or, for example, if they know that this particular person is known for constantly putting out uh, content, you know, uh, flogging other people's products, so they've already mentally, sort of, subconsciously know to treat everything that he or she says with a pinch of salt because it's probably something they've been paid to do or you know if it's a footballer everybody knows that footballers have sponsorship deals so if a footballer is saying something positive about football boots it's pretty obvious to people oh well that's just you know so and so who plays for us and he's advertising puma boots because you know that's that's what he has to do so you know maybe <laughs> maybe the, the, the kids will be educating us in a few years time when they really get to grips with what's going on. And, you know, we, there maybe there's solutions that we haven't even thought of and we're incapable of thinking of yet at the moment uh, about how these things should be identified. Well, that links to Michaela's question, I think, on, in the chat on education. There are a lot of questions. People are very engaged. This is great. So I suppose when you're thinking about education, I mean, I always come up against, you know, we say education would be a big part of the solution, but 
what kind of education, and as Kostya said, we might be looking at this the wrong way because we didn't grow up in the right kind of environment, and who should the education be directed at? Uh, did you have any thoughts on this? I mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, I mean, part of it, I think, is the parents having more understanding about this area, which links again back to Costia's, uh, the research that you looked at, which is, it seems like understanding of this whole area, even amongst adults, is incredibly poor, um, which, which, which is very difficult. Um, I saw someone, for example, uh, mention YouTube kids in the, in the chat, and I think that in particular will be very interesting to see how that develops over the years. Um, like, you know, does it become an actual safe space for kids when it comes to things like this? Um, right now, the regulators are very, very um, hot on looking at YouTube kids, particularly from a, a, like a data privacy perspective for kids, i.e. is YouTube slash Google using children's data inappropriately for advertisements um, in those on those on that particular platform, which is very much, again, look at it from the platform's perspective. But, you know, is it perhaps leaving all these product placements, etc., from these kid fluences that Hannah rightly mentions? Um, so I think, you know, perhaps once the data privacy piece is, you know, ha has, has progressed, you know, minds will be turned more towards the deceptive advertising point, but it is interesting to see how these platforms are developing. And I think, I think YouTube advertising on YouTube kids was only triggered, I think early last year. So this is all incredibly new and there's probably not a huge amount of research out there about, you know, does, does a kid, for example, being on YouTube kids make any sort of difference for, content like this is it is it any better than it is on normal youtube yeah indeed like what isabel said the parents uh, play a very big role they also should be aware that uh, this kind of advertising is happening um and then of course the regulator with all the regulations that are in place right now but next to this um very also important stakeholder is the school and uh, i've read like a very interesting uh case study on like a school that tried to um, like um, educate their children uh, on that these practices are happening to a game where they should like watch um, a video of an influencer and then afterwards analyze if uh, the video contains advertisement or not. Um, and so those are like very, very clear examples of advertisement like Kostya said, like the natural pose or like the the um yeah something like that so i think yeah the parents the school and of course like youtube as itself uh but right now uh with like the new measurements uh imposed by the european union we have we are already one step ahead but yeah we're not yet there i think i think kirith's point is interesting um it, it's true that i think there probably is a distinction between ronaldo saying I'm Ronaldo and these are my boots, full stop, you know, okay, he's probably been paid to say that, but that's probably less of an impact if that is properly tagged or not tagged because it's Ronaldo and you're going to want to just be like him. But, it, you know, if it's something which is more like a review, which is providing an opinion about a product, then probably, I guess, I don't know what the correct threshold is, but somebody who's less famous, you know, your, your, your current average common uh, run of the mill influencer as opposed to you know a hyper celebrity i think in those situations Kira, it can genuinely be a situation where it's it's misleading and it's yeah probably those are uh, are sort of the more sensitive ones but i guess it's just politically and legally untenable to have different rules for you know very famous people and slightly famous people I mean, let's let's not get into a question of whether there are in practice different rules for some famous people and other rules for less famous people. Uh, this interesting question from Alex, and I think this is about the practicalities of you know what you do when you want to do the right thing. I guess uh, I work in an esports agency, and most of the contracts only care about having hashtag ads when the influencer posts on Twitter. What are other ways? to make sure that people watching it understand that something an influencer puts out is sponsored, which I guess is an example of somebody wanting to do the right thing. Well done, Alex. Yeah, I mean, there's no magic bullet. In, in the UK, a hashtag ad is very on vogue at the moment because it's short. But actually, again, research was not conclusive on that. A lot of people found that hashtag ad, it's only three symbols and it's quite easy to miss even if you put it at the beginning of the content. So 
um, I would just say, you know, whatever built-in tools exist on whatever platform you're using, make sure that those tools are used because they will just make the post as a whole look different. And, you know, rather than it definitely putting stuff up front as opposed to buried in a sea of hashtags is, is better. It's still not great, but it's, it's better. But the thing that a lot of people don't do, and I can kind of understand why, is just be upfront and, you know, say in your own words, explain what the situation is. Just be honest with, uh, with whoever's reading you know, your community. Just say, you know, like I said with Evan, you know, Nintendo sent me this game. They've also paid me, but, you know, it doesn't mean that what you're saying is necessarily untrue, you know, if you, you know. I guess there are people who will accept money and say positive things about something which they genuinely dislike, but there's also a lot of influencers who genuinely like a product and they're thrilled when a brand approaches them and asks them to, you know, do some sponsored content because they genuinely like the stuff or they like the game. So I think as long as they're being very upfront and explaining it in normal human being words to other people, then that's probably the best way of identifying what the content is. And then you don't have to worry about whether it's sponsored advertising or something else, because in most countries, it just boils down to being very clear about what the financial arrangement is, no matter what word you, you choose to use. Yeah. It's interesting, though. Oh, sorry, Hannah. No, 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 go ahead. Also, I think it is interesting, though, because in the UK, as as Cosi said, the hashtag ads become this kind of nebulous term that I think a lot of stakeholders are actually getting quite frustrated now because, you know, the, you know, bodies like the ASA and the CMA are saying, put it, put hashtag ad, even if it was a freebie that they sent you, even if it was something they've paid you for, even if they didn't have influence over the video, even if they did have influence over the video, there's just a whole spectrum of, um, you know, potential content that this could cover. And quite rightly, brands are just going, looking at it and go, but is hashtag ad, okay, fine, let's, let's, let's use that because that seems to be the most as um as Cosi said on vogue term across the board at the moment although by no means by no means covers absolutely everything um so i can see it being very challenging for brands because they think well, do i need to put a hashtag on this as you know as you said if we're just doing a, i've sent someone a freebie and they're going to send it back to me afterwards um so there's definitely a lot of gray area in the background here that i think i can understand the company's quite frustrated with to be quite frank but then it's balancing the trying to find something easy to apply for the, as many people in many situations as possible or trying to have a bit more nuance but potentially courting that gray area a bit more yeah indeed i i think hashtag ad you you're always right if you put like hashtag ad most of most of the time if you want some concrete features i can give you some um because like kostya has said like the central placement put it like in front of a uh, like the content that you're playing, like hashtag ad, and then put it in, like the, the content and then not like a hundred of hashtags and then like somewhere between like hashtag ad. Um, for instance, um, a, a very striking color, uh, a funny example was that uh, they did a research with uh, what would be the most effective um, kind of advertisement disclosure. And it was like a black rectangular with like, yellow letters advertisements to um of course on on twitter you cannot use like all these different colors but if you can uh, have a donald trump style warning <laughs> <laughs> yeah the non-advertising content of this tw tweet is disputed <laughs> click here for more <laughs> it's true yeah i think if you do it just like hashtag ad um and again if you like open to it that you're it's also okay to um, use social media nowadays for uh, advertisements. Every company does it. So, um, and also like the, the people on uh, social media are way more aware that these practices are happening. So, yeah. That I think uh, Michaela had a great point, which I think links to what we've been talking about. Perhaps the negative reaction of the community is a stronger deterrent than external regulation. And to get very to get very less sick about it, we've talked about law as a mode of regulation. We've talked about code in in a way using uh, platform tools and other things, you know, other sort of more technical things like that. And perhaps we can wrap up the discussion by thinking about how we could create uh, well, we could create some sort of uh, culture. Uh, I think Costa, you said, how do we make we make 
we 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 may we would make undisclosed advertising look uncool and untrendy, and that's how that's one of the ways we win. Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you know the whole drugs are bad. Okay, you know it's 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 whenever you want to tell somebody that something is cool or uncool, you're bound to fail. But I think the best you can do is just kind of ex expose people to the different types of content and just show them what the differences are and explain what the differences are. I mean, it's and it's not rock once they understand i think it's not rocket science to draw your own conclusions from the fact that you know this person's been paid to say this you know you can draw your own conclusions about whether or not what they're saying is true or not true um but you can't draw those conclusions if you just don't understand what the, the business model in the background is i have a feeling this will improve pretty quickly because you know i think the stat was something like 95 percent plus of teens and tweens spend more than one hour or several hours on social media per day so it, you know this exposure is just absolutely phenomenal to this kind of stuff um i i suspect you know people will get to grips with it over the next few years reputation as well can be a powerful tool but i think there's the risk that you know I think somebody mentioned in uh, the comment uh, Jake Paul or Logan Paul and you've got people like that who have just done you know probably quite objectively not very nice or good things online who still rampage around having a jolly old time making lots of money and I think there's definitely been research out there I think possibly mentioned in your uh, uh, article Hannah about you know people feeling very defensive towards influencers um that get into trouble because because there is that that perceived close relationship or that relationship of like a, a sister or a brother um so it is it's, it's a difficult thing to say that would definitely work and i know at least in the uk and certainly i think in other european countries a lot of the um you know the decisions that can be made by the advertising bodies are essentially a slap on the wrist and a little case on a website but you know particularly for kid influencers what five-year-old's gonna care if they're you know if their if their favorite influences had a slap on the wrist from the advertising standards authority unless their parents are somehow have cottoned onto it and perhaps restricted their child from viewing this um individual so it, it, it's difficult and i definitely don't think it's a magic bullet um unfortunately yeah indeed there is not really a magic bullet but the only thing what i actually thought was a very interesting point is what Kostya said earlier that maybe we're looking at it the wrong way and in a few years maybe our children will like educate us because they are also aware that um influencers get paid by um um yeah by enterprises and so on and i think it's also very important because they develop such a close uh, relationship with their um with these influencers that the influencer doesn't really want to harm um its community does again also like uh, Isabel has said reputation is a very big point but again there is no measured ballot and we'll see where it gets us in the next couple of years. It's amazing the speed at which kids pick up digital skills I remember we were talking about other issues like you know the safeguarding of children the whole online harms initiative which is a whole separate kettle of fish which i'm not going to open here but there was some research done was it was it by the ico i think about sort of awareness of kids about uh you know people contacting them in virtual environments like games and you know whether or not something is somebody's genuinely just trying to be friends with you or something is a scam or is likely to be dangerous actually i was really impressed by the percentage stats on that about how kids were like well yeah obviously if somebody just randomly chats with me in a game and I don't know who they are and they tell me to meet them in a park after school obviously I'm not going to go because that's just a weirdo who, you know so I, I think you know it's a, it's a slightly uh, different example but I do think that when you grow up with this stuff there with you day to day you, you will pick it up pretty quickly so um, yeah I have faith in kids yes um well i think that's a very optimistic note on which to draw this session to a close we have faith in kids and perhaps we would like to have some faith in platforms uh that they they can do the right thing and i hope it doesn't take you know an insurrection uh this time for them to do the right thing when it comes when, when it comes to keep influencer advertising okay uh, i would like to thank the panel very much for all of your thoughts i think we've had a very interesting discussion and uh we, I think, you know, we're now better informed, perhaps, on how to ways in which we might we might approach this problem. Um, and I want to thank CCLS for hosting this uh, event, and 
I want to thank our great audience for being so engaged, for putting in so many questions and giving us so much to think, to think about. Thank you. And we'll hopefully we'll see many of you at our next event, which you will definitely be hearing about. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.